Have you ever wondered what slab options that you have when building a house? Well, stick around because in this video, I'm going to share the three most common types of concrete slabs, when and why you should use each one of them. Then moving forward, you'll be able to reference this nifty little video when it comes to slab selection time on your next residential development project. Let's get into it. Hey guys, Peter Kelly here from Little Fish Property Developments. We help everyday landowners just like you maximize the value of their land through low risk development projects. On this channel, we share everything you need to deliver successful projects time and time again. If you aren't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything. It is important to note that your concrete slab is a big ticket item. So it is one of the more costly parts of your project. Suppose you get your selection incorrect. It can cost you significant time and money. Different engineers will specify different types of concrete slabs and not always for the right reasons. It isn't uncommon for them to lean a specific way for no reason at all other than that's the most familiar slab to them. As a property developer, it is your responsibility to know the options that you have, when and why to use each one. You must understand that one size doesn't fit all. The type of concrete slab that you select will come down to your site and its specific environmental conditions. And as I say all the time, on this channel, you need to do your own research. Never assume that your providers and suppliers are doing the right thing. It is incumbent on you to have the required knowledge to hold them to account. Otherwise, you could be costing yourself a lot of money and you don't even know it. For the most part, for a flat site, there are three main options. One of which isn't exactly a slab as such, but it's a genuine option nonetheless. We have raft slabs, waffle slabs, and we have subfloors with strip footings and stumps. Looking at it simplistically, selection would be based based on the proposed structure type, environmental conditions, and your finished floor levels. First up, let's look at raft slabs. The raft slab has been in use for a long time. They consist of edge and internal concrete beams formed like a grid pattern, integrated with the above ground slab. Raft slabs are suitable for most soil types and site conditions, and have been used widely over a long period of time. As the raft slab beams penetrate the ground and are found into the natural soil profile, the raft slab generally offers offers better soil movement resistance than the other footing systems. Therefore, you can use a raft slab for any soil classification. As the reactivity increases, the concrete beam depth increases also, and the grid spacing decreases to make a slab stiffer to resist the soil movement due to the seasonal moisture variations. Now let's look at waffle slabs. Relatively speaking, waffle slabs are new compared to raft slabs. And generally speaking, waffle slabs are considered most builders' preference, especially in the new estate developments where there is fierce competition among builders offering competitive building contracts. This is mainly because no beam excavations are required in the waffle slab preparation process, which allows builders to estimate the required concrete quantity accurately. Waffle slabs are particularly useful if the finished floor level needs to be raised 600 mil above existing ground level and the client wants a concrete slab. In a scenario like this, the waffle slab becomes a more economical option than the raft slab. It means that the concrete and excavation can be accurately estimated so that the builder can provide a more accurate quote, giving them the best chance to win the project. Now, as the slab sits on the ground, extreme care should be taken during and after construction. If there is flooding or water leaks from the downpipes, water can seep under the slab, making the soil soft and loose losing its bearing capacity, ultimately resulting in slab failure. Also, there will be numerous plumbing excavations under the slab. If these haven't been backfilled correctly, this may also lead to slab failure. Unfortunately, these problems are hard to detect at the time. There have been a lot of issues in new estates due to issues such as this. Now let's look at strip footings and subfloors. This is a super old construction method. Almost every old house in Melbourne consists of either strip footings or stumps or a combination of both. This method is used useful mainly when the finished floor levels are much higher than the ground levels. It is also very laborious and nowadays builders choose not to use strip footings or subfloors unless the clients request it or it's the engineer's recommendation due to the conditions on the site. This method is also generally suitable and economical for a sloping site. At the end of the day, it's going to come down to who you have engaged to work with. You need to connect your project with a quality engineer who appreciates their choices and the financial implications of those choices. As a residential property developer, you need to be confident in the decision 
decisions made by your contractors, particularly on these big ticket items, such as the type of concrete slab. If you aren't on top of this, you will end up with a one size fits all engineer. I promise you in most cases, it'll be the wrong call that negatively impacts your project and ultimately it's bottom line. That's a wrap guys. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments box below. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I'm Peter Kelly. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy developing.